Welcome everyone to our Stories That Inspire series. Glad to see everybody here on the call and we're gonna get started. So I'll start off by introducing myself. Many of you may know me, but my name is Eva Brito. I am the director of the Women's Center at Bristol Community College. Here in front of you is a image of our Women's Center and um, it is located in the E building of our Fall River campus. And on the side, I have the mission of the Women's Center. And our mission at the Women's Center is to provide a safe and supportive space of empowerment and advocacy. And um, through, through advocacy and education, the Women's Center promotes the concept of intersectionality that gender intersects with all other markers of identity and thus helps students to understand the complexity of their lives and the lives of others. And that's really um, our work here to support students in their journey and then to look at how gender intersects with things they're learning in the classroom and outside of the classroom and most important to be a safe and supportive place in doing that work. So that's a picture of our place and hopefully we'll be able to get there soon with um, COVID. So for today's Stories That Inspire, um, I started this series, Stories That Inspire, when I started here at the Women's Center because I believe there's power in someone's story and that we can connect and learn from each other's story. We've had about close to 30 speakers for the Stories That Inspire. And I've been often asked, when are you gonna do a Stories That Inspire? And I said, I would do it before I leave the college. So I'm here today to share my story. Hopefully that you'll get um, something inspiring from it and to follow through on my word. So we're gonna begin with stories that inspire. I am an involving poem and I believe that we are all poets. I think that sometimes we forget about that magic that we're all born with and hopefully we remember it throughout our lifetime. But many of you may know that I am an author of a book, Essence, Tones, Whispers and Shouts. And I decided to frame our conversation with the words in the title of my book because those words really encompass who I am and I think that would be a good way to share my story with you. So we'll go into that. Essence. So essence uh, is reflective of my earth, my roots, my background, who makes who I am, my backbone. And for that, I have to start where I came from. And I was born in West Africa, Cape Verde Islands, Cabo Verde, and you see on the image there, it's located on right on uh, near Senegal on the West Coast of Africa. Many folks know Cape Verde for being the place where hurricanes start. For me, that's where uh, my roots are and uh, my homeland is. I'm really proud of that fact. I wanted to show you a little bit about the beauty of where I come from. I grew up in the island of Boa Vista and that translates in English to beautiful view. And they didn't name it that for no reason. Um, this location that you see is uh, on my right is a beach called Praia de Chaves and um, it is about a 15 minute walk from my house. So my childhood, I would go there very often and you know, on the right, you see some sand dunes that if there's a place on earth that I feel the most connected to, it's there. It's um, my core in terms of the earth space. And I just loved it as a kid, I would just roll down the sand dunes and I could spend the whole day and still I'm um, a kid at the beach as I think about that. So I wanted to share a little bit about, you know, my childhood and where that looked like. And of course, if I'm gonna speak about my story, I wanted to share you with you who've been, who formed, um, Eva and who created the woman she is today. And that would be, I start off with my mother on my left and she was instrumental in who I am. I come from a lineage of very strong women, including her and my grandmother and great grandmother. Um, a little bit about my mother. She grew up in a time when, you know, the knowledge and understanding was that women didn't have to go to school, especially young girls, that their place was at home taking care of the household. So my grandfather, her father um, lived in the United States and he would send money to help. And he said he had a, um, she has a sibling. And so she, he would send 
money for her brother to go to school at the time and help but she, you know he didn't feel like my mother needed to be in school but my grandmother was like not on my watch so she said yes you do need to go to school and you're gonna go to school so she tells me about being the only girl in her classroom because back then most girls didn't go to school so she went through her elementary school and pretty much most of her um, education as the only girl in the class and she said that was challenging to be with all around all boys at the same time but her mother was saying that no, she needed to be there. So I come with this understanding that women are powerful, that they can be in spaces that, you know, they may not be the majority, but that does not take away their strength and power. So that's always been instilled in me from her that, you know, you can achieve anything despite what society says to you. And in addition, what I think I've I got a lot from my mother is the power of an education. You know, she has that background. Of, she could have easily, and I'm sure she has times that she didn't want to be there being bullied by the boys, but she continued on. And she continued on to be an educator. She was an educator in the COVID for 25 years. Um, and to give you a little context of what that looked like at when she was born, k -Bird was colonized by the Portuguese. So it was a whole different um, structure than it was now that we have our own independence. So she became an educator and during her, um, in her early 20s, and then during that time, a little afterwards, um, Kaybird got the independence through the works of the man you see on my right, Amilcar Cabral, um, a revolutionary leader that fought for the independence of Kaybird in Guinea and Africa, and a man that had foresight way before his time. So when he came um, and was able to help in the independence of Cape Verde, they made it that now all children should go to school and not what was before. So she was then tasked with having to provide all the children of the different villages and education, which she said was really overwhelming because they only had a few teachers. It wasn't something that was a lot. And now you had all these kids that needed to have an education. And she talked about having to go to different villages because they just didn't have a teacher for the town. So she would travel to different villages because she said, you know, she wanted to do that. She wanted to make sure that all the children had access to education. And it was a really profound, I probably should have put a picture of that too. Um, I went to visit a few years back to Cape Verde and she showed me the classroom where she taught. And it was a one um, room classroom with just a chalkboard, bare minerals. I mean, minerals, <laughs> bare, um, really bare to the bone. And it really just, spoke to me and the privilege that I have to have this education that we have here today in the United States because so many don't but she wanted to make sure that others could provide for that and so that the power of an education has always been instilled in me and an education inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. In the middle is my father and his father, my grandfather on his um, side. And it's funny I've never saw my father with a pipe but in that picture he has a pipe so He's not a smoker, but he, um, I got a lot from my father as well. You know, he's a very intelligent man. And some of the things I got from him is this um, spirit of activism and social justice. He was uh, in line with Cabral's thoughts and read a lot of his books and felt like he wanted to be a pioneer and support the work of the liberation movement. So he was helping with uh, doing um, petitions and really getting the word out and at that point it was seen as radical because you know to overcome to overthrow the government would and at that time was radical and the Portuguese government really had a lock on the people and if you did say anything of that you could be jailed and was seen as conspiracy and all these things so um, he really pushed for that in his own ways and I really like that and he always instilled in us a value of our indigenous roots of being African of having a joy and pride to be Cape Verdean. So that was really a big part of what I got from my father and also the uh, entrepreneurial spirit and that you could always persevere. He, at the age of um, early twenties left Cape Verde and went overseas to Europe and worked in different cargo ships. He's traveled the world. He's been to the North Pole as a certificate. Like I've been to the North Pole, Alaska, Japan, all throughout the world for about 15 years, he traveled the world. And he said, you know, the reason why he could survive, you know, he went there not knowing the language and was able to overcome is that he said, you know, there's always a solution. And through the way you treat people and through having a positive mindset, you can always um, persevere. And that's what I got from my dad, that spirit of entrepreneurship. He came back and then he started his own business in the island of Boa Vista and was a, the first one on our um, island to have a car and just really started um, 
a lot with his entrepreneurship spirit. And so I always got that, that there's always, <laughs> when I tell him there's a problem, he's like, what's the solution? That was, let's not focus on the problem. So I got that, those um, values and those are the pillars that, you know, make up who I am and my foundation. And so then we came to the United States. Um, this is us when we first arrived or somewhere in that time. And many folks think that, you know, you leave your country because, you know, poverty and other stuff, but that wasn't the case for us. My mom was an educator and in the Cape Verde Islands, being an educator was seen as a job of prestige. My dad had his own business. He had his own company. I mean, we were one of the few people at first to have a, a, a TV. I remember people come to our house and it was like a movie night. So we had, um, I would say a good class uh, life for being there in the Cape Verde Islands. And then they decided to leave because my mom really wanted us to have a good education. And she understood more than anyone else that how um, there was holes within the education system. So she decided to come to the United States and with her dad being here, so we could move here to New Bedford, Mass. So this is us when we first um, came with me, the little one in there with my brother and sister, my grandfather and my mom, and that's a cousin of ours. And again, to the power of the education. And I'm so thankful now for the sacrifice because they left a job with prestige, a really comfortable lifestyle to come here to make sure that we had a fair share at a better chance in life. So I appreciate that for, um, I appreciate them for that. And my dad said that was a really hard decision to leave um, that Cape Verde. And he said it's one of the few times he cried when he left because he had worked so hard to build that up and to know that he had to close the door and not knowing he was gonna go back. That was really difficult for him. The other parts of Eva um, that I wanna share with you is my tones. And that is of me as a multidisciplinary artist Art flows through me in different ways. To me, it's uh, my water and that, you know, whether it's writing, whether it's sound, um, whether it's movement, whether it's performing arts, I just feel like I need arts to feel alive. And it's been my healing for many ways. It's a space that I can heal myself. So this is a part of me that I wanted to share too, as I tell my story. And I have some images here, one being of me performing um, so I'm a poet and many folks that don't know me just know me as a poet and um, I really I guess evolved into becoming a poet I never uh, visioned myself as a poet even though now I understand that we're all poets and the first time I understood the power of words was when my grandfather passed away he had passed away and I was a freshman in high school and at that point he was living with us and we had really formed a bond. And that's the first house we went to when we came to the United States. So, you know, I, he was instrumental in my life. And so when he passed, I was really distraught and sad. And I decided to write a poem about how I felt. It was really just putting words on paper and just letting it all out of free, um, free writing. And I shared some of it with some of the family and friends. And they said, that's really powerful. You should share it in service. And I did. And I got a lot of feedback. And that was my first time that I realized this power in words and what you can say. And from that, I continued to write in college. I uh, would go to spoken word events and so forth and got the title of poet. And I've continued to perform in different places throughout the country. And that's me performing at the onset um, festival. It's a Cabridian festival they have each year. So it was really cool to be on stage when I was there as a young girl, a lot of times looking at artists and to do that um, that day. Calabana also performed, which is this Cape Verdean artist. In the middle, I have some of my artwork that I've created. As I mentioned, um, I do art in different forms and these are multimedia pieces. I was a artist in residence for the New Bedford Whaling National Park. These are two pieces I created there. And what I decided to do is pick poems from my book and create pieces, art pieces from them. So the one that looks like the water is called Imagine. And um, the other one is called music that I put. And so that's the woman's body. So I challenged myself to do that. And then the last, as part of that, I also, we had a group of folks come from Rhode Island. We did a Cape Verdean heritage tour and to really speak to all the history of Cape Verdean um, history that has been made within the New Bedford. So we did that. And one of the things that I think about my artistry, I ended up going to school at Sal Regina and getting a graduate uh, degree in expressive arts. And to me, what really that meant was it was a breath of fresh air because throughout my life, I've always used creativity, the arts as a way 
to explore feelings, the ways to connect with people. And it really reminded me, and my last paper, I told them, thank you for reminding me of my truth because it reminded me of the power of the arts and how it can be used for healing, connecting with people and how it's not just, ooh, la la, it feels good. It's a whole brain experience. So I really um, can really encompass what I learned there and continue to use that as a way to connect with people. It's a little bit about my tones. The other portion of, uh, my connection and self is whispers my air um, and that we all have a spiritual life. As the quote says, just as a candle cannot burn with, without fire, man cannot without a spiritual life, the Buddha. And that's really been a part that I continue to evolve in my spirituality as I grow. And spirituality comes in different ways. For me, one of the ways that I see spirituality is with my connection with Mother Nature and really uh, it has, Mother Nature is able to soothe us in ways that we often can't get from a human being. When I feel distressed, when I feel different ways, I go to nature, I go to water and I, it soothes my soul and it speaks to me. So that image in the middle is a eco art um, piece and I really love it. I love it how it speaks to eco feminism and how we need to treat Mother Earth. Um, and it also speaks to the knowledge that we are not on Mother Earth, but we are with Mother Earth and we are here and it knows so much more. We so often think that we're in the top of the totem pole, but Mother <laughs> Nature knows so much more and it was here before us and will be here after us. So that speaks to my connection to that. Also, you know, my ancestors, I spoke about my um, mother and grandmother and how they were really instrumental. So I feel like they're always with us. And I didn't share this, but my mom's also very spiritual. I grew up in a home where many times I didn't know the answer. She said, well, you know, ground yourself, think about it. And that I had that inner wisdom and that was always instilled with me. So I feel like we carry our ancestors everywhere we go. And that piece from the African-American um, Art Museum, I think in, embodies some of that. And then becoming a mother really, um, elevated my spirituality and the power and the beauty of being a mother and a woman. We're such divine beings to create life and having a baby inside you. It was just an amazing experience. So that increased uh, my spirituality. And I also wanna say, you know, having, um, becoming a mother was one of the most beautiful and it was also one of the most difficult points in my life after um, having the baby, I had postpartum and it was really challenging time for me. I didn't share that with a lot of individuals. And I think it was part of that knowledge that many women carry that we have to be the strong woman and we don't show our weaknesses. And part of what I, I see now that it was a blessing and I wanna be able to create spaces where if other women feel that way, we can create bridges of community and support and really debunk this myth that we don't need each other and that we can we could do it because it's not true. You know, we're all connected beings and the more we can have spaces of community and support, the better we can be. Shouts. So the last word in my book that speaks to my fire, my passion, my commitment to social justice and really being able to speak to um, all the injustices that exist in this world and how we can create change. I love the proverb, until the lion has, has his own, until the lion have their own historians, the history of the hunter will always glorify the hunter. So that's so true. And we need spaces in which we can create uh, truth to come out and change the narrative. And that's what I've tried to do. And with a lot of the work I've done within college, I did a lot of social justice work after college, working in different organizations, doing women's groups, I went to school, became a social worker. So that's really just been in line, that spirit of my father saying that, you know, um, we have that activism within you always came through. I'm gonna focus, you know, for the time being, the work that I've done at the Women's Center in some of the work. I was really blessed and fortunate to be the inaugural director of the Women's Center. I was over the moon when I got the job and I really got to speak to the leadership here at Bristol because when I, was hired, the VP that I spoke to when I first got the job, said, well, you know, what is it that you want? What is the vision you want for this center? What do you want me to create? And he said, I trust your leadership and that's why I hired you and this is your vision. 
And I was the kid in the candy store because, you know, that was a blank slate as an artist for me to create. And, you know, there's nothing more you want as an artist. So I was able to create the mission, the vision, and I want to share with you some of the things we've done. These are some of the pictures we've had, um, you know, tea time and um, learn lunch and learn series. We had a woman in Holocaust. We brought some of our students to the state house for advocacy day. And a lot of our work has really been about advocacy and talking about how we can create change and understanding the inequities that exist in our world. And as students at a college, they have so much power to share that voice. Just more images, you know, as we're here, the stories that inspire having spaces where women of color and different women can share their story and their truth has been really important for me and the work that I've done. Here at the college, not only students, but faculty and staff. This is an example of an outing that we did in creating fellowship and places for women to build one another as we go through the experience. The woman of, um, this was the leadership summit that we had uh, a few years back, and that was in partnership with the Department of Disability Services and really showing that people with different abilities can also have empowering stories and really being a place of inclusion was important for me in the work that we do here at the Women's Center. Another example a highlight was we had a Vote Run Lead. It's a national organization which we partnered up with other community organizations to do a training on how women can learn the process to run for office in our um, whatever level they want to. So this was a picture of us at the training here at the college. This is just some of the things that we've done. Definitely not the full list. Women of color. We've started the first Women of Color um, Family Night to really support our women of color and different projects we've done. As we are in the current moment, we know with the pandemic, we have um, really, women have always um, had challenges to be a parent and to go to college, but with the pandemic, those challenges have really heightened. So we wanted to create a program to support women Women have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic when we think about, you know, uh, childhood and the issues and the responsibilities that come with motherhood and not having childhood and the domestic duties really rely more, despite what the changes our society might say has changed on women. So we wanted to create a program to support women with that. And the Parenting Advancement we, Pathways Program, we launched this in March and it's dedicated towards mothers on the campus. Uh, our target audience of women of color and single mothers, but any mother, and we have a cohort of 13 women, they get mentorship, they get um, financial literacy skills, and it's really a space that women can empower one another, learn and really support their growth here at the college. I'm really proud of that program, and that's a five-year program that we launched this year. In addition, as I mentioned, with the pandemic, women have had a lot of challenges as we all have. So the Women Writing History Projects is a project based on the Women's National History Museum in which we recorded stories and had faculty, staff and students give submissions of what their experience has been during COVID. And those stories are now archived um, in the Bristol Library. So if generations past come and wanna know what was it like to live during the 2020 pandemic, they can hear real stories and read real stories of that because we wanted to make sure that the women's voice was not left out and was heard during this time. And then we were really proud of that as well. The journey ahead. So um, as many of you may know, I am gonna be transitioning from my role here at Bristol. And um, I'm really excited for the journey ahead. It's bittersweet because as I think of um, the work here to be the inaugural I've gotten to know many students and, um, but I'm also excited of what can come ahead. And I think if I had another title to the book, it would be evolving because um, that's where I'm at. Um, I'm reminded of Maya Angelou's quote, you have no idea what your legacy will be because your legacy is in every life that you touch. And that makes me really feel good about leaving the, the 
despite having missing the work that I'll do here is that I've created uh, spaces and structures that women and all students can really be empowered and can have access to resources just as others before me have done as an immigrant to this country created different programming ESL programs migrant programs so that I could be able to transition and my growth I'm able to do that now so I'm really um, honored that I've been able to create that and I'm creating a um, business of my own IBC, not only my initials, Eva Brito Consultancy, but I, you know, know thyself, be understanding um, to be present and to be and see the ever open, the ever open eye, you know, the clairvoyance to see what is seen and unseen is kind of the acronym as well. And that's, um, I'll share you the mission of that. The best way to explain, I think, is to share the corporation's mission. IBC is on a mission to advance Indigenous women throughout the world, we are committed and dedicated to fostering the healing of women from the detriment effects of colonialism, moving people forward globally. And that's our goal to really use all the things that have encompassed me, my roots, my love for the arts, for the healing, and to create spaces of activism and empowerment to support women. Because when you support women, you support a community, in my opinion. So I'm excited to do that. And as I think of um, all the experiences I shared with you and my experiences at Bristol, I think of a story that um, I recently had, or a conversation I should say, I recently had with a Native American elder. And I'm very much intrigued by the Native American culture. I love their respect and honor of ancestry, of Mother Earth. And in my conversation with this elder, she had said something to me that struck with me. She said, ceremony is inside us. And it just made me think about it really in a different way, the word ceremony that I had thought before, that I'll have ceremony if we attend to it. And I think of that ceremony as every exchange that we've had, every exchange I've had with folks on this call, with students, with here at the college and my life experience has created the ceremony within me that I tap into. And I wanted to leave you with this poem because I think it speaks to, encompasses a little bit of everything I spoke to before I go. So this is my poem for you. Ceremony. Ceremony is inside us, sprinkled with stardust from galaxies that made us. Ceremony is inside us, walking in harmony with mother's beat, hand within wisdom's dirt. Ceremonies inside us, a sun dance of sunlight drumming tapestry. Ceremonies inside us, exchanging breath blessings with vision sessions. Ceremony is inside us, sacred as the web's dawn and sleep's portal. Ceremonies inside us, still as the night sky, loud as the ocean's roar, craving for wanting more. Silent as seashell whisper memories. Ceremony is inside us with wingspans of ancestral knowing, cocooned with imaginal cells, transforming our insides while we listen to its symbiotic love song. So I thank you for listening to my story and um, for experiencing this with me and that's my stories that inspire. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions or comment, um, feel free to ask. I'm used to be in both <laughs> when this happens, I usually say, well, I, so <laughs> now it's a little different when I'm a speaker. But um, thank you, Adrian. say that was beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Um, I would just like to say thank you, Eva, for all the work that you've done. I've only known you for a few, a few short months, but the amount of work that you've done to help all of these different women throughout our campus has been absolutely inspirational. And I'm so glad that I was able to meet you, at least for the short time that I did, because hopefully uh, your advocacy and your outreach that you did will continue to inspire me throughout the rest of my life. So thank you, Eva, and I wish you well. Oh, thank you so much, Julie. For folks that don't know, Julie works with me here at the Women's Center 
and she's amazing in her own way, in her own right. But I appreciate her. I also appreciate her with this because I wasn't initially going to do the stories that inspire. I said, well, I think someone else. And she's like, if someone else had asked you to do it, you would have been 100% cheerleading them to go. And I said, you're right. Um, what about that? We so often celebrate others, but don't give space, especially as women to celebrate ourselves. So I appreciate your wisdom in that. And I appreciate all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. See in the comment. Hi, Eva. Hi, um, I just want to express my gratitude uh, for you, uh, for your leadership at the Women's Center. And to tell you that, of course, uh, Bristol is going to miss you uh, um, dearly. But, you know, as, as you say, you, you know, we, we have to evolve, right? Uh, we can stand still. So um, I've been honored to have you not only as a colleague there, but as a friend before you came to Bristol. So, um, we, of course, we, we continue to collaborate. I know we have collaborated. I, I saw, thank you for, I, I saw myself <laughs> with you on one of the pictures there, uh, yeah. with one of the collaborations between the Luzo Centro and the Women's Center that we brought uh, a woman from Mozambique to, to, to tell the story to, uh, you know, of other African countries. Um, so uh, the connections that we, we have with humanity, not only, you know, with Cape Verde, of course, uh, but with other African countries, at least the Portuguese uh, language, um, of African countries. So uh, once again, thank you so much. Um, um, I know that you're going to do great in your new endeavor. So I'm looking forward to follow you uh, on, on the next step that you're gonna do. Thank you. Mm. Uh, Eva. Thank you so much, Carlos. I hope that my internet is not going crazy. Yes. I don't know if my internet is. Can you hear everyone? Yes. No? Yes. You can't hear me? You yes. can't hear me? Okay. Okay, good. I, go ahead, Adrian, and then I'll respond to Carlos as well. I don't want to cut you off. Go no, ahead, Adrian. No, no, no. You can go ahead, and then I'll go after you. Okay. okay. Um, Carlos, thank you so much for your words of um, friendship. As you mentioned, we have been friends prior to uh, the college and will continue that as coming from, you know, I think of your mother and I think of other strong women that came to this country and had sacrifice and, you know, brought all these children and look at all you, you and your sibling and how successful and beautiful you guys are in your own right. So I think of your mother too. And um, I love, you know, one thing I will, I'll always remember one of the events we had at the Women's Center Carla spoke up and he said, you know, I'm a feminist. And I think that was so important to have spaces where men say that it's not just women that can be feminist, that, and, you know, feminism is about having equality in that and uh, social justice. And so often it's seen as a place of male bashing and I don't, I've never viewed it that way. So I appreciate you, Carlos, and your vision and in your leadership here at the college. We've collaborated on many events and I see your leadership here as a space that speaks to social justice, bringing different voices to the table and always doing it with grace in a beautiful way. So I appreciate you and everything that you do. And I appreciate that um, you send me with lots of love. <laughs> so thank you, Carlos. Adrian, the floor is yours. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to thank you for sharing your art with us uh, today. I think this is the first time that I've actually had a chance to see uh, your paintings and to hear your poetry and it was really beautiful and um, clearly you've shared your work before so this is not new for you but it was new for me and I thought it was really really lovely and and added something special to your presentation so thank you. You're welcome and we, we carry so many hats I think as colleagues sometimes we just know each other for the work we do in our respective departments but it's good to see 
because we're never one thing, right? It's always these commas that go after our name. We're teachers, we're educators, we're mothers, we're artists, we're all these beautiful things. So I appreciate you, Adrian, and our um, relationship here, and you're always supporting the Women's Center and all the great work that you do too. So thank you for that. Thank you. It was a bit choppy, but okay. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has a comment, not that you need it or um, a statement. If don't, um, we'll probably wrap up, but I want to give the space if someone does have a comment. Yes. Um, sounds good. Okay, so I will take that that everyone had a great time, <laughs> but um, I know that we're busy and I appreciate everyone for coming on and for hearing this story. There will be, I hope, more stories that inspire because I think it's really powerful to hear someone's story and it goes back to that we're more different, we're more alike than we are different in our connections. So um, I appreciate everyone and have a great day. Thank you so much. <laughs>